Welcome! In this video, we'll be covering axiomatic set theory by going over the zermelo frankel axioms. In the last video, we saw that we can make the basic definitions of set theory by using a comprehension principle. However, this very unrestricted version of set comprehension leads to paradoxes. And thus, in order to avoid these paradoxes, we need to use a weaker version of this comprehension principle. Unfortunately, this means that a lot of the definitions we would like, like the definition of power sets and unions, uh, no longer are guaranteed to be sets. And therefore, we need to add additional axioms in order to guarantee that these objects actually exist and are sets in our theory. This is accomplished by the so-called ZFC axioms. So that stands for zermelo frankel axioms with choice. So these are a set of nine axioms that allow us to build up all of set theory based on first order logic. And well, from there, because most uh, of the rest of mathematics can be formulated in terms of uh, axiomatic set theory, you can in principle think about these axioms as being the foundation for, um, well, all of modern mathematics. In this video, I'll start out by listing all of the axioms in sort of an informal manner to give you an overview of what um, they say. And then in the remainder of the video, we're going to go through each of them in detail and explain exactly what they mean. The first and perhaps most fundamental axiom is called extensionality, and it tells us when two sets are to be considered to be equal. So it says that if sets x and y have the same elements, then in fact x is equal to the set y. This is precisely the definition for equality of sets we gave in the naive treatment of set theory, and here it forms the first axiom of ZFC. The majority of the remaining axioms of ZFC assert the existence of certain sets. So the second axiom here is called pairing, and it tells us that whenever we have two sets, small a and small b, there is a set that contains exactly those two elements, a and b. In other words, if we already have two sets, a and b, then we can form a set that contains those sets. Now I should mention that in this ZFC axiomatic set theory, all the objects we'll be considering are themselves sets. So while in our naive treatment, we thought about a set as being sort of a collection of any sort of object, here, the objects that we'll be considering are all themselves sets. This isn't in fact a big restriction because you can construct many of the usual mathematical objects based just on sets using these axioms. For instance, you can construct the natural numbers using sets. And from there, you can basically construct the integers, the rationals, and the reals, um, also realized as certain sets. And so in principle, uh, sets can uh, then actually be uh, numbers, like real numbers, for instance. This means that the pairing axiom can sort of be interpreted as saying, if you have any two objects A and B, then there is a set containing those two objects. But well, these uh, objects here in ZFC are themselves sets, but they could represent things like numbers, for instance. The third axiom is called separation, and it gives us this weaker version of the comprehension property we saw in the last video. It says that if capital Phi is a property, which means that it's some first order logic formula that possibly can depend on a parameter P. So uh, P here is just some sort of a free variable occurring in this formula. And then we take some set x, okay? Then we can form a uh, set y that consists of all the elements u and x that satisfy this property capital Phi. And moreover, this, this y, which consists of sort of a filtered version of the set x, is itself a set. In other words, if we have any set x and we have some property, then we can form the set of all elements occurring in X with that property. And that thing, according to this axiom, is again a set. Now, the reason this is a restricted version of the comprehension principle we saw in the last video is that here we're sort of only filtering this set X. So we're only considering elements U that occur in the set X that satisfy the property. And we're not considering any sorts of elements whatsoever that satisfy the property. In other words, using this separation axiom always only gives you subsets of existing sets. In particular, this means that you can't use this comprehension principle here to construct 
uh, very large sets like the set of all sets or that sort of thing. The fourth axiom here tells us that unions exist. And it says that for any set x, there is a set y that is just the union over x. Now here, this is uh, slightly different than the uh, version of unions we saw in the last video. So in the last video, we saw like binary unions, so unions of two sets. And the union of two sets just contained all the elements that occurred in either set or both. This version of unions here uh, works in a different way. So here we think about x as being a set of sets, uh, namely the set of sets that we want to union together. For instance, if x consists of, let's say, sets a1, uh, a2, and a3, then the union over x would consist of all the elements that occur either in a1, in a2, or in a3, or in, in multiples of them. So if we would write this with our binary union notation, this would somehow be the set a1 union a2 union a3, where this small union symbol here is the binary union. In other words, this uh, big union here is just a way to union together a family of sets. And this family of sets is, uh, well, x. In particular, we can realize binary unions, but we can also union over an infinite collection of sets using this axiom. Next, axiom 5 tells us that power sets of sets exist. So for any set x, there is a set y, namely the power set of x. So that's the set of all of the subsets of this original set x. Okay, so axioms 4 and 5 together are necessary because, well, this separation no longer allows us to construct uh, unions and power sets. So far, all of our axioms here, 2 to 5, have been of the form, well, if you have some sets or a set, then you can get some more sets. But none of these axioms actually tell us that there are sets at all. Therefore, we need some axiom that tells us that certain sets exist. And axiom 6 does precisely this. It's called the axiom of infinity. And it says that there is an infinite set. Now, when we go over uh, this axiom in detail, we see exactly how you would uh, define an infinite set. Um, so there's a uh, precise formulation of this. Um, but here you can just imagine that this axiom is stating that there exists some infinite set. In particular, there exists some set. And based on that, one can then actually form the empty set using uh, separation. The final three axioms are maybe uh, a bit more complicated. So axiom 7 is called replacement. And it says that if a class f is a function, so here you can just think of f as a um, function in the sense of assigning elements in the domain to elements in the codomain. And moreover, um, x is a set. Then we know by this axiom here that the image of x under this uh, function f is also a set. So the image here is all of the image points f of x where uh, the points x lie in the set capital X. In other words, this axiom here is telling us that, well, if we have some set we can start out with and we have a function that has that set as a domain, then the image of that function is also a set. The second to last axiom 8 is called uh, regularity. And it ensures that we can't have these uh, paradoxical situations where we can have uh, sets that are an element of themselves. The statement of regularity here says that every non-empty set has an element minimal element. We'll see exactly what this means when we go over uh, this axiom in detail. But as I said, one consequence of regularity will be that we can't have sets that are elements of themselves. Finally, there's the axiom of choice, which is the last axiom of ZFC. It says that every family of non-empty sets has a choice function. Intuitively, what this means is that if we have some family of sets, then regardless how large this family is, we can choose one element from each set of the family. So here you can imagine the setup is that you have a bunch of bags with things in them. And the question is whether you can simultaneously choose one element from each bag. 
And the axiom of choice is essentially saying that this is uh, always possible regardless of how many bags you have and what they contain. And as such, it's a really strong axiom, and we'll uh, discuss a bit uh, what consequences this has. All right, so this concludes the overview of the axioms. So I hope that all right now you can see that, well, while there's quite a few of these axioms, they're not actually so bad. And I hope that you can already start seeing the purpose of each one. In the remainder of the video, we're now going to go through each of these axioms in this order. And in the process, we're also going to build up the basic definitions of set theory based on these axioms. By the end of the video, we'll actually have basically all of the foundations necessary to start doing uh, usual mathematics using uh, this axiomatic foundation of set theory. We're going to start by taking a step back and talking about the formal language that we'll be using to talk about set theory. As I mentioned previously, the language of set theory will basically be first order logic, but we have this additional relation symbol for being an element. So the two ways that we can compare sets are going to be to use equality and also being an element. So these are the basic relations that we can have between sets. Moreover, all of our variables that we'll be using will represent sets. So in this axiomatic version of set theory, every object that we consider will be itself a set, and then we'll have some sets being elements of other sets, and so on. Now using these relation symbols here, we get the following form for atomic formulas. So atomic formulas are either of the form x is an element of y, or x is equal to y. And well then, based on these atomic formulas, we can use the usual logical connectives here, so that's conjunction, disjunction, negation, implication, and equivalence, in order uh, to build up more complicated uh, formulas that allow us to state various properties. Because we're in first order logic, we also allow for the use of quantifiers, so we'll have the universal and existential quantifiers as well. Finally, we introduce some notation for formulas. So we write phi of u1 up through un when phi is some formula. And moreover, all the free variables in phi occur among these variables u1 through un. Remember from the video on first order logic that a variable is free if it's not bound by one of these quantifiers. The significance of these free variables is that depending on what object you insert for the free variables, the truth value of your formula might change. And therefore, we have this notation here that says that, well, if we write it like this, so phi of u1 through un, then it means that all of the free variables that occur in phi are among these uh, variables that we put um, in the parentheses after the formula. Now notice that here I'm just saying that the free variables occur among these. So in fact, I could put additional variables here that don't occur as free variables in the formula. But the important thing is that all the free variables that in fact do occur in the formula also appear in this list. The second preliminary thing we'll introduce are called classes. And essentially, classes just give us a convenient way to talk about formulas. Now, in some versions of axiomatic set theory, but not in ZFC, classes actually form objects in the theory. But here, classes will just be sort of an informal way of talking about formulas in a more convenient manner. In fact, classes will sort of realize this unrestricted version of comprehension that we had in naive set theory. And then, well, we'll be arguing that certain classes are in fact sets. So in order to define a class, you need some formula. So here, let uh, phi be a formula which depends possibly on x and on uh, p1 up through pn. Well, then we call the following uh, comprehension a class. So this is the, well, class of all x that satisfy this formula, phi of x and uh, p1 up through pn. So uh, x is a member of c, so it is an element of c, if and only if, well, this formula holds for x. Now, because of this equivalence here, it means that classes are completely determined by the formula that defines them. 
And in this sense, classes are just another way to talk about logical formulas, but it's convenient because classes somehow look like a set comprehension. As is the case for sets, uh, two classes will be considered equal if they have precisely the same elements. In fact, because of the way we've defined classes in terms of their elements being precisely those that satisfy uh, this formula, it means that two classes are in fact equal precisely when their defining formulas are logically equivalent to one another. This is again compatible with the idea that classes are just ways of talking about formulas because, well, equality of classes is just logical equivalence of formulas. Now, because we don't put any restriction on the formulas that define classes, we can, for example, define this universal class. So this is all the x such that x is equal to x. And this is, in fact, like the class of all sets because all sets satisfy this formula here. Next, we can define inclusion for classes. So a class C is included in a class D if, well, all elements x in C are also elements x in D. Now, if you think about this in terms of the defining formulas of C and D, this is just saying that for any choice of x, the defining formula of C with that fixed x implies the defining formula of D. We can also transfer the definitions we had for the set theoretic operations in the last video to classes because these classes are essentially uh, this unrestricted comprehension we introduced there. So we can define the intersection of two classes, uh, C and D, to be all the elements that occur in C and in D. We can define the union of two classes to be all elements X such that X lies in C or X lies in D. Uh, we can define the difference between two classes as being all those x that lie in C but do not lie in D. And finally, we can define a big union over a class C to be all the x such that x occurs in an S for some s occurring in C. So this last definition is uh, not something we saw in the last video and is maybe a bit confusing. So here we think of C as being some sort of collection, S1, S2, and so on. And now if we take the union over all of these S's, well, this is just, you need to think about this as being somehow the union of S1, S2, and so on. So the union over this uh, C, which is like a family of classes S's, um, is just all the elements that occur in at least one of these uh, S's here. That's exactly what this definition is saying. So it's all the elements x such that x lies in one of the s's for some s that's an element of c. So here c has the role of being like a family of classes s, which we're unioning together. Finally, we can note that every set s is in fact a class, and it's defined by the following uh, formula. So it's defined by being all the elements x such that x is an element of s. On the other hand, there are classes that are not sets. For instance, this universal class here is not a set. And such classes will be called proper classes. With that background out of the way, we can now turn to the first ZFC axiom, which is extensionality. Remember that extensionality defines what it means for two sets to be equal. So here's the statement in words. So if x and y are sets that have the same elements, then in fact x is equal to y. Now all of the axioms in ZFC are actually formulated in first order logic. So this uh, description here in words is really just a description of the corresponding first order logic formula down here that I've written in blue. So this formula here says that for all elements u, if u is an element of x, if and only if u is an element of y, then this implies that in fact x is equal to y. In other words, if every element of x is an element of y, and conversely every element of y is an element of x, then in fact x is equal to y. So I personally remember these types of uh, definitions based on the, the statement in words. 
However, here it's maybe not exactly clear what it means for two sets to have the same elements, and that's made perfectly precise in the first order logic formula here. As a side remark, uh, the converse of this implication here also holds uh, by logic. So if two things are equal, well, then they have exactly the same uh, properties. In particular, they will share uh, the same elements here. So if we wanted to, we could actually uh, strengthen this axiom here to have this be an equivalence. So two sets are equal precisely when they have the same elements. Um, but this is not really necessary to add as an axiom to ZFC because it already follows just by uh, logic. We now move on to the second axiom, which is called pairing. So it says that for any sets small a and small b, there is a set uh, containing exactly those two sets a and b. The first order logic version of this statement is as follows. So it's the, the formula down here. It says that for all A and for all B, so these are the, the sets we're interested in, there exists a set C. So that's the, the set we're trying to build, such that, well, for all elements X, X is an element of C precisely when X is either A or B. All right, so you need to think about this C as being this set containing exactly A and B. And this condition here, is saying that, well, the elements of C, so the elements X of C, are precisely um, either A or B. So X is an element of C if and only if X is equal to A or X is equal to B. We'll see this type of pattern here cropping up a lot. So it allows us to define exactly what the elements of a set are because you just say, well, for all sets X, x is an element of this set you're trying to define if and only if some condition holds. And that condition defines the, the elements of the set in question. Moreover, whenever we define the set using the previous pattern, it'll be unique because we're essentially saying exactly what the elements of that set are, and therefore any other set that satisfies uh, this property, namely that we exactly specify what its elements are, uh, will be the same. So by the extensionality axiom, this pairing set uh, containing A and B will be unique, and therefore it makes sense to adopt this notation here. Based on this uh, pairing axiom, we can actually start building up some interesting sets. So the first uh, interesting set that we can define are singleton sets. So the singleton here, so that's a set just containing A, will just be defined as the pairing of two times the set A. So if you choose A to be equal to B in the pairing axiom, then you basically just get singleton sets. Perhaps more interestingly, we can use the pairing axiom to define ordered pairs of sets. So the uh, ordered pair, A comma B in these uh, pointy brackets is defined as follows. So we define this ordered pair in the following way. So first we take the singleton um, containing the set A and then we take the pairing of the sets A and B, and we pair these sets together in a larger set, like so. Now, at first glance, it might not be entirely clear what this is doing, but in fact, what we want from this ordered pair is the, the characteristic property of the ordered pair that I introduced in the last video on Neve set theory. And in fact, if you define the ordered pair in this way, that characteristic property holds. So the property states that two pairs, so A comma B and C comma D should be equal precisely when the first components of the ordered pairs are the same and also the second components of the ordered pairs are the same. Hence this construction here using sets allows you to realize ordered pairs as certain types of sets. Now as an exercise, you could think about how to prove uh, this property here based on the definition of an ordered pair. Finally, once we have ordered pairs, we can extend ordered pairs to arbitrary n-tuples by just iterating the ordered pairing. For instance, if you want to have a three-tuple like this, well, then you first just take the ordered pair of A with B, and then you pair that with C. And in a similar manner, you can just iterate this. So if you want four tuples, then you pair a three-tuple with an additional element, and so on. If you use this construction method, then in fact this 
uh, characteristic property of the ordered pair somehow transfers to n tuples. So in fact, you can uh, prove that uh, two n tuples are the same precisely when each of their entries at the corresponding position are the same. Okay, so from the first two axioms, so from just extensionality and pairing, we can already construct quite a few interesting objects, in this case, uh, ordered pairs and n tuples. We now move on to the third axiom, which is separation. And as I have said uh, multiple times, separation is a weaker form of the set comprehension principle we saw in the last video. The statement of the separation axiom in words is as follows. So we let uh, phi be as some formula which might have free variables u and p. And then for any set x and any set p, there is a set which consists of all the elements u and x that satisfy this formula phi. In other words, the separation axiom allows us to filter the elements of x based on this formula phi. Moreover, this formula here also has a parameter p, which we can vary if we wanted to. Now in first order logic, the separation axiom is phrased as follows. So it says for all sets x, so that's the set we want to filter, and for all p, so that's the uh, parameter value we're setting, there exists some set y, so that'll be this uh, filtered set, such that, well, the following uh, property holds, namely that for all elements u, u is an element of y, if and only if, on the one hand, u should lie in x, on the other hand, u should satisfy this formula phi with the parameter p fixed, as we did. Here you can again see this pattern, which we saw previously in the pairing axiom, so this defines what the elements of the set y are. Well, elements of the set y are precisely those elements of x that satisfy uh, this formula here. Now, in contrast to the previous two axioms, the axiom of separation is actually an infinite number of axioms. It's a so-called axiom schema, because for each formula, uh, phi of up, we have such an axiom. So you see here that in the formula, phi is like fixed. So for each formula, we need to have such an axiom in order to uh, use separation. Notice that in this original formulation of separation, the formula that we give the separation axiom can only depend on one parameter. However, using n tuples, we can actually extend this type of axiom to be able to accept several parameters, p1 up through pn. The way to do this is, well, you start with a formula, phi that possibly depends on multiple parameters, and then you let this uh, phi of up occurring uh, in the axiom of separation be the following formula. So here you need to think of this p as now being an n-tuple of the parameters p1 up through pn. And so the formula you uh, write is the following. So you write there exists p1 up through there exists pn, such that on the one hand, this parameter p is precisely the n-tuple of p1 up through pn. And also, this formula with the several parameters, phi of u, p1 up through pn, holds. So essentially, what you're doing is you're feeding this formula phi here in n-tuple p, and you're then unpacking this n-tuple uh, using this there exists and so on, such that p is equal to p1 up through pn. So that's essentially like unpacking each of the components in the n-tuple. And then you're using this unpacked n-tuple, so the parameters p1 up through pn, to check the original condition you had, which depended on several parameters. All right, so this is perhaps not the easiest thing to follow. Uh, you should probably go through it on your own again if you want to understand what's going on here. The reason I'm mentioning it here is because in what follows, we'll actually be using the axiom of separation uh, with several parameters as well. And the reason this is okay is because of this argument that I just presented. Now, one way to think about the axiom of separation is saying that subclasses of sets are again sets. So basically classes are defined in terms of formulas. And well, if we filter a set based on a formula, that would be like a subclass. And the axiom of separation is telling us that those things are again sets. This idea is useful in the following manner. So suppose you have some class C, which is 
uh, all elements u that satisfies some property phi and uh, that depends on some parameters. So if this is a class, then, well, if you take any set x and consider the intersection of x with c, well, then that will consist exactly of the elements u in x such that this property holds. Now, by the separation axiom, this is a set. And therefore, if you intersect any class with a set, what you get is a set. Another way of uh, saying the same thing is that, well, if C is in fact a subclass of a set X, well, then this implies that, well, C intersection X is just equal to C, right? Because every um, element in C is also in X. So the elements that C and X have in common are just the elements of C. And well, we saw above that uh, if X here is a set, and this is just a general class for the moment. Well, we saw that uh, this intersection here by separation, this will again be a set. And hence, because this intersection is equal to C, we now can conclude that C is also a set. Therefore, whenever we define a class and can show that it's in fact a subclass of some existing set, then we can conclude that that class is itself a set as well. And in fact, this is how we'll usually be using the separation axiom. So we won't be applying it directly. Rather, we'll just be arguing that certain classes, which we define in terms of formulas, are sets because they are a subclass of some larger set. For instance, we can use this type of argument to now show that certain operations we defined on classes also work for sets. For example, consider the intersection. So the intersection of two classes, x and y, is a subclass of y. And therefore, if we assume now that x and y are sets, well, then this thing here on the left is a subclass of the set y. And therefore, this is also a set. And this shows that the intersection between two sets is again a set. A similar argument works for set difference. So the difference x minus y is a uh, subclass of x. And therefore, if both x and y are sets, well, then also the difference between them will be a set. On the other hand, this type of argument doesn't work for things like unions and power sets, because those operations give us bigger objects that aren't like a subclass of some pre-existing set we can define. Hence, we'll have to have axioms that tell us that unions and power sets are in fact sets. We can also use separation to define the empty set. So provided that at least one set x exists, we can define the empty set using separation. Namely, we define it to be all the elements u in this set x such that u is not equal to u. Now, because there are no elements u that are not equal to themselves, this means that the set you get by, well, applying this condition to all elements in x will in fact be empty. So this is one way of defining the empty set. Moreover, by extensionality, the empty set is unique because, well, if you take any other empty set, so a set that doesn't have any elements, it'll have exactly the same elements as any other empty set. Now, so far, we don't actually have enough axioms to really conclude yet that the empty set exists. We only know that if there is some set X, so if there is at least one set that exists, then we can form the empty set. And so then the empty set would also exist. Now, using the empty set, we can say what it means for two sets to be disjoint. So two sets x and y are called disjoint if their intersection is the empty set. Finally, we can extend the idea of intersection over families of sets. So if C is some non-empty class of sets, so you have to think about C as being like a collection of sets, then we can define the intersection over C. So this is just the intersection over all sets x that occur in the collection C. And it consists of all elements U, such that U is an element of each of the sets X in the collection. So this is just a generalized version of the intersection that can work also for possibly infinite collections of sets. Now, because this intersection here will be a subclass of any of the X's occurring in it, and moreover, we assume that those x's are sets. 
it means that, in fact, this intersection will also be a set. OK, so we've seen that using just separation, we can define the operations of intersection and set difference. But as I mentioned, for unions and power sets, we'll need additional axioms. So that will be the following two. So the axiom of union says that for any set x, there is a set y that is the union over x. And as I explained in the introduction here, this big union should again be interpreted as unioning all of the members of x together. So here you have to think about x as being some collection of sets, let's say s1, s2, and so on. And the union here is unioning together each of the sets that occur in x. In other words, this union consists exactly of those elements that occur in at least one of these uh, sets s. This idea is expressed in the first order logic formula for this axiom. So it says that for all sets x, so that's uh, this collection of sets that we want to union together, there exists y, which will be the union of those sets. And then we have, again, this pattern which defines the elements of y. So for all u, u is an element of y if and only if the following condition holds. Namely, there exists some z where z is an element of x. So here this z corresponds to these s1, s2, and so on that I've written up here. So these are like the sets occurring in the collection x. So if there exists a z such that, well, z is an element of x, and moreover, the element u we want to put into the union should be an element of z. In other words, the elements of y are precisely those elements u that occur in at least one of the uh, z's that lies in the collection x. Perhaps this will become a bit clearer with the following definitions. So based on this general union, we can define binary unions. So in order to union together a set x with a set y, what you do is you first pair x and y into a set. So now you have a collection of sets that contains the sets you want to union together, and then you take the union. Then once we have these binary unions, we can actually um, express sort of sets containing uh, finitely many elements. The way to do this is just to say that a set consisting of finitely many elements is just the union of all of the singletons containing those elements. So while the pairing axiom allowed us to create sets containing exactly two elements, uh, the union axiom now allows us to create sets that contain a finite number of specified elements by just unioning together the corresponding singletons. We now move on to the fifth axiom, which is that for power sets, so it says that for any set x, there is a set y, which is the power set of x. In first order logic, this becomes for all sets x, there exists a y, which will be the power set of x, such that, well, y is defined using, again, this pattern. So for all u, u is an element of y if and only if u is a subset of x. In other words, the power set y consists of all subsets of x. Now this subset relation here isn't something that's primitively defined in set theory. Hence, we need to define this subset relationship as follows. So u being a subset of x, this is equivalent to the following formula, namely that for all elements z, if z is an element of u, well, then z is an element of x. So if you wanted, you could just substitute this formula here into this uh, axiom up here, and it would be the same thing. However, the axiom stated in this form is much more clear about what this set y we're constructing is. Now, the set that we obtain here, so all uh, elements u, such that u is a subset of x, so this will be called the power set. Again, the set is unique by the extensionality axiom. And as we'll see in just a moment, the power set axiom together with unions will allow us to build uh, more interesting set theoretic constructions. The first thing we can do now using the power set axiom is we can define Cartesian products of sets. So given two sets x and y, their Cartesian product is just the set of ordered pairs x comma y, where x lies in x and y lies in y. Now the reason this comprehension here is legitimate, 
and defines a class is because we can rewrite it as follows. So we can rewrite it as all elements u such that there exists x and there exists y such that u is equal to the ordered pair of x and y. And also this first component x lies in x and the second component y lies in y. Now, a priori, we only know that this thing here defines a class, but we actually want it to be a set. And the way to show that it's a set is to show that it's a subset of something we know to be a set. And in fact, the Cartesian product x times y is actually a subset of the power set of the power set of x unioned with y. Now by the union axiom, the union of two sets is a set, and then by power set axiom, taking power sets of sets again gives you sets, and therefore uh, this thing over here is a set. And because this thing is a subset of this very large set here, um, it means that uh, this thing is also a set. Now for me at least, it's not uh, clear at first glance that this uh, subset relation here actually holds. So let's think about this for a moment. So the elements of the set uh, x times y uh, are these types of ordered pairs, right? Thus, in order to show that this relationship here holds, we need to show that, well, every uh, pair, like order pair x comma y, is actually an element of this uh, large uh, power set of the power set of x union y. Now, if you remember, we defined ordered pairs in terms of the following uh, construction. So we took uh, the first component and put it in a singleton, and then we paired that with uh, both components put in a set by pairing. Now, because x is an element of the set capital X, this uh, set here, the singleton of x, this is in fact an element of uh, the power set of x. And moreover, uh, this thing here is in fact an element of the power set of x union y. This is just because the set here containing small x and small y is itself a subset of the union of capital X, capital Y. Now, if you wanted to, you could also think of this singleton containing x, which is an element of the power set of x, as being an element of the power set of x unioned with y. In other words, the power set of x is itself a subset of the power set of x unioned y, because every subset of x is also a subset of the union x union y. So overall, this argument shows that this ordered pair is a subset of the power set of x union y. The reason for this, again, is because each element in this set is an element of this power set. Now, by the definition of power sets, if you're a subset of some set, well, then you're an element in the power set of that set. So this in turn means that, well, this thing you could also consider as an element of the power set of the power set of x union y because, well, it's a subset of this one level power set here. Hence, we've shown that any ordered pair, so any element of this Cartesian product here, is actually an element of the power set of the power set of x union y. And therefore, this entire thing here is a a subclass of this uh, power set of the power set of x unit y. And because this thing is a set, it means that this thing is now also a set. Finally, we can extend this binary Cartesian product to finitely many sets by just iterating this binary operation. In other words, we define the product of x1 up to xn plus 1 to be the product of x1 up to xn just times xn plus 1. So this just corresponds to iterating this binary product here n times. Moreover, we can introduce this notation here, x to the power n, to mean that we take the Cartesian product of n copies of the set x. Now that we've defined Cartesian products of sets, we can introduce relations, and then from relations we can introduce functions. So an n area relation R is just a set of n tuples. In other words, a relation R is just a subset of some Cartesian product. Now, if the relation R is a binary relation, meaning it's a subset of just the Cartesian product of two sets, then, well, its elements consist of ordered pairs, x comma y. And in order to uh, write this a bit more nicely, whenever a pair 
uh, x comma y occurs in the relation R, we just write x R y. The intuitive way to think about this is that the relation describes certain relationships between elements of a set x and elements of a set y, and two elements are related precisely when the corresponding ordered pair is an element of the relation. And hence we write x R y to express that x is related to y. Once we have relations, we can define their domains and ranges. So the domain of a relation is just all of the first components that occur in the relation. So it's the set of u such that there exists a v where u is related to v. In other words, we're just projecting these ordered pairs that occur in the relations onto the first components. Similarly, the range is just the set of all v such that there exists a u such that u is related to v. This just means that we're taking all of the ordered pairs occurring in the relation and projecting onto the second component. Now again, in this definition, a priori these things are just classes. We don't yet know that they're sets. But in fact, it turns out that both the domain and the range of a relation are subsets of the union over the union over the relation. Let's think about why this claim is true. So the relation R consists of some set of uh, some ordered pairs, right? And I'll just uh, write a single one here. And this ordered pair here is equal to the set containing the singleton x and also the set containing x and y. And now let's think about what happens if we union over R. Remember that uh, unioning over a collection basically just takes the union of all the sets occurring in the collection. So here the collection is denoted by these outer parentheses, and then the sets that we're unioning over are basically these uh, sets that occur inside. In other words, the union over R will consist of all uh, sets that occur in at least one of these ordered pairs. So for this first ordered pair, things that occur in the union will be well, the singleton containing x, and also this uh, set containing x and y. And then we'll have additional elements here occurring um, that, well, are basically the singletons of all of the first components of the ordered pairs, and then also uh, sets containing both the first and the second components of each of the ordered pairs that occur in the relation. Okay, and now if we take another uh, union over this set, well, then we're just unioning together all of these sets that occur in uh, this larger set here. And so this union over the union of the relation will, for instance, contain just the element x. It'll also contain the element y because, well, we're including this set here in the union. And moreover, it'll contain basically, well, any of the components that occur in, in the ordered pairs in the relation. Okay, so let's say I had some additional uh, ordered pair here. Let's call it uh, uv. Well, then in this uh, union over r, I would have now an additional set singleton u and uh, the pairing u and v, like so. And then now in this union over the union of the relation, I would now also have the elements u and v occurring since, well, u and v both occur in at least one of the sets occurring in this, in this set here. In particular, you can see that the domain, which is just the first components of the ordered pairs in the relation, well, each of those first components occurs in this set, and therefore the domain is a subset of this union over the union of the relation. And a similar thing goes for the range, because each of the second components of the ordered pairs occurring in the relation uh, will also be an element of this uh, double union here. So that proves that these things here, which are in principle just classes, are in fact sets because they're subsets of this larger set. And we know that this is a set, well, because, well, on the one hand, we know that the Cartesian product is a set, and, well, R is just a subset of the Cartesian product. And, well, if we union together sets, we get sets by the uh, union axiom, and so this thing is definitely a set. Once we have relations, we can also define functions to be special types of relations. So we say that a binary relation f is a function if it has the following property. So we want that for all x and for all y and for all z, 
if x is related to y via f and also x is related to z via f, then in fact we want y and z to be equal. In other words, this property is saying that f relates some given element x to at most one other element. So this is saying that the function should be single valued. So for each uh, input to the function, you want to have at most one return value. Now because of this uniqueness expressed in this property, we can write y is equal to f of x for the unique value y that x is related to via f. So this gives us our usual notation for functions where we write f of x for the value that f assigns to x. We can now further think of a function as going between two sets in the following way. So we say that a function f goes from a set x to a set y, and we denote it like this, so f going from x to y with the arrow. Uh, this holds if on the one hand the domain of the function is equal to x, and on the other hand the range of the function is a subset of the target set y here. In other words, we want our function to be mapping every element in the, the set it's starting from to some element, and we want that element that it maps to to lie in the target set y. Moreover, we can then define the image of a function. So the image is basically just the set of values in the target set that are mapped to by f. In other words, the image f of capital X is the set of all y such that there exists an x in x such that y is equal to f of x. Now here in this formula, I've used this uh, restricted quantification, so there exists x in the set x. Um, this is not formally part of our language, but we can convert this restricted quantification to an unrestricted version um, in the manner that I discussed in the video on uh, first order logic. Finally, we can consider the class of all functions going from a set x to a set y, and in fact, it turns out that this class, uh, which we denote y to the x, is in fact a subset of the power set of the Cartesian product of x and y. Why is this? Well, a function is just a relation, right? And a relation is just a subset of the Cartesian product of x and y. Hence, every function is a subset of the Cartesian product, and thus, every function is an element of the power set of the Cartesian product x and y. Hence, we conclude that every element of this function space here is an element of this power set, and therefore, uh, this inclusion here holds. Now, because we know that the Cartesian product is a set and the power set of some set is a set by power set axiom, uh, we can now conclude that also uh, the class of functions from x to y will form a set. We can now move on to our next axiom, which is the axiom of infinity. Informally, this says that there exists an infinite set. Now, finiteness is usually well phrased in terms of the natural numbers, and so far we haven't yet constructed any natural numbers, so we'll need some other way of defining an infinite set. So rather than saying what an infinite set is, we're in fact going to define what's called an inductive set, and it'll turn out that inductive sets are in fact infinite once you construct the natural numbers, but uh, for the moment this inductive uh, set definition is, is much simpler. What it says is the following in first order logic. So it says that there exists some set S, so that's the uh, inductive set we're interested in, such that the empty set is an element of S, and also for all elements X in S, x union the singleton x is also an element of s. Okay, why does this give you an infinite set? Well, uh, let's start writing down s, right? So on the one hand, we know that the empty set is an element of s, so that's uh, the first part of the definition of s. And then we know that for any element x that occurs in s, if we union that element together with the singleton containing that element, that also needs to be an element of S. Now, so far, we only know that the empty set is an element of S, 
But now we can apply this inductive part of the definition to conclude that S has to have an additional element. So that element would be of the form X union the singleton containing X. So in this case, we instantiate this with the empty set being X. So we know that the empty set union to the singleton containing the empty set, this also needs to be an element of S. On the other hand, because the empty set has no elements, if you union with the empty set, you just get back uh, whatever set you're unioning with. So this is equal to just the singleton containing the empty set. All right, from this we can conclude that also the singleton containing the empty set will be an element of this set S. And now we can proceed in the same manner. So we now know that uh, by the inductive condition that uh, the following set here, so the uh, set containing the empty set unioned with the set containing the set containing the empty set has to be an element of S. And uh, what is this? Uh, well, here we're unioning uh, the set containing the empty set with this larger set. So the result will be the set containing the empty set and also uh, the singleton containing the empty set. So from this, we now conclude that also uh, this set is an element of S and so on. So each time you apply this uh, inductive uh, part of the definition, you'll get a new set and therefore, um, this process will continue on indefinitely. And this means that this set S actually has to have an infinite number of elements. Now, if you were paying attention before, uh, you might notice that, well, we said when we defined the empty set that the existence of the empty set depends on the existence of another set. And the set we're using to sort of obtain the empty set is in fact this infinite set here. So it might seem like this definition here is circular because in order to uh, know that the empty set exists and define it, we somehow need to first assume that S exists, but somehow the definition of S is in fact making use of this uh, empty set. But in fact, there's no circularity occurring here. To see this, you would just replace this empty set symbol here by its definition. So it's all the U's in S such that U is not equal to U. And in this case, the statement then just becomes a statement about the existence of a set S such that it contains as an element some set which is defined in terms of that set S and it also satisfies this additional condition here. We now move on to the replacement axiom, which should now be clear that we've defined functions. In words, it says, if a class F is a function and X is a set, then the image capital F of X is also a set. Now in our definition of functions, we defined functions as being certain relations and relations were in turn subsets of the Cartesian product of sets. Now, if you replace the Cartesian product of sets with a Cartesian product of classes, so that would just be ordered pairs where each component occurs in the corresponding class, then you uh, get basically a definition of a function that isn't necessarily a set. So these would be more general functions, which are not necessarily a subset of a Cartesian product of sets, but rather are subsets of a Cartesian product of classes. Now, what this axiom is saying, if we have such a function, which doesn't even necessarily need to be a set, and we look at the image of a set under that function, then that image is in fact, again, a set. In other words, we can somehow map existing sets using functions. And even if those functions aren't necessarily sets themselves, the, the image that they define will again be a set. Now in first order logic, you express this as follows. It's a bit lengthy because we have to kind of include the definition of a function uh, in the formula. So we say that, okay, for all X, for all Y and for all Z, if phi of X, Y, P and phi of x, z, p, uh, both hold, then y is equal to z. So this part here of the definition is essentially saying that the formula phi here defines a function. So you need to think about uh, this phi of x, comma, y, comma, p as saying that phi maps x to y if we fix the additional parameter p. 
And similarly here, the second one is saying that phi maps x to z under the fixed parameter p. And hence, in total, this condition here is saying that x is mapped to a unique uh, target value, because if you have x being mapped to y and x being mapped to z, then in fact y is equal to z. In other words, this formula phi here uh, defines a function, and if this is the case, so uh, that's basically what this premise here is saying, so if the formula phi defines a function, then, uh, well, for all sets x, there exists a set y, namely the image set, such that for all elements small y, y is an element in small y, so this is defining uh, the elements of y, if and only if there exists a small x in x, such that phi of x, y, p. So uh, phi maps x to y. Okay, so this formulation is perhaps a bit confusing, um, but uh, yeah, the easier way to think about it is just saying that we define some class of pairs, um, x, comma, y, um, such that, well, phi of x, comma, y, p holds. Now in that case, the hypothesis here is precisely saying that this class is a function for each fixed p, so maybe I should call this like f sub p or something like that. And then the premise is saying that, well, under this assumption that f sub p is a function, then there exists a y, uh, namely the image, and uh, the image is defined using this formula. Now since p here occurs free in the formula, so it's not being bound by any quantifier, uh, the way to interpret this axiom is probably to say that well, this type of axiom holds for, for any choice of parameter p. So perhaps a better way to formulate it would be to uh, put a quantifier for all p in front of this uh, large formula. This already brings us to the final two axioms, which are regularity and choice. These are perhaps also the most difficult to understand. So regularity uh, says that every non-empty set has an element, minimal element, and well, essentially this is just the term for what this formula is expressing. So it says that for all sets S, if S is non-empty, then this condition holds. This condition is precisely what it means to have an element, minimal element. So this condition says that there exists some element X in S, such that that element is disjoint from S. So S intersected with X is the empty set. In other words, regularity is asserting that in each set you have to have at least one element that is disjoint from the set that it's contained in. Now phrased in this form, the axiom isn't particularly clear about what its consequences are, but the one consequence of the axiom is that uh, you can't have these uh, infinite uh, sequences of inclusions of sets. In other words, you can't have a set x0, which has as an element a set x1, which has as an element a set x2, and so on. And you can't have an infinite sequence of like this being an element of. Now, if you consider this set here, so the set containing x0, x1, and so on, and you additionally assume that each uh, xn plus 1 is an element of xn, so you have an infinite sequence like this of uh, being an element of, well then, for every x in S, so for any uh, x you choose here, there will exist a y in S, so some other set, namely the next one, such that y is an element of S, okay? So for any uh, choice here, for instance x0, I can find another set, namely the next one, so in this case it would be x1, such that, well, x1 is an element of x0. So that's what the, this uh, hypothesis here is asserting. And this holds for every element of S, because I can just always choose the next set occurring in S, and this will be, by this hypothesis here, an element of the uh, set uh, preceding it. Okay, but if this statement here holds, so for all X in S, there exists a Y in S such that Y is an element of X, well then it's the case that for all X in S, um, S intersected with X is actually non-empty. Well, why is this? Well, you just pick some let's say, an xn occurring in S, right? And now we know that uh, xn plus 1 is an element of xn, but on the other hand, xn plus 1 is also an element of S. And therefore, 
S intersected with this Xn will at least contain this element Xn plus 1 because this is an element both of Xn and also an element of S. So this uh, means that this is non-empty and this holds for any choice of X in S, okay? Hence, in conclusion, if we assume this type of infinite sequence here, then this implies that for all X in S, that X is not disjoint from S. But that uh, is exactly the negation of uh, what uh, this statement here is saying, so this condition. So in that case, this set S would violate the regularity axiom, and hence we conclude that such infinite sequences here can't exist. Okay, so we've converted this regularity axiom into one of its consequences, saying that we can't have such an infinite sequence of being an element of. Perhaps forbidding such infinite sequences here still seems a bit mysterious, but it has some consequences which uh, are desirable. So if you can't have such an infinite sequence, in particular, you can't have any set that's an element of itself, because otherwise you could write out an infinite sequence uh, as follows, so you would just write like x is an element of x is an element of x, and you can go on uh, forever like this. So in this case, you can't have any x which is an element of itself. And moreover, for similar reasons, you also can't have any cycles. So you can't have a set x0 being an element of a set x1, and so on, uh, up to a set xn, and then that xn is again an element of x0. Because otherwise you could, uh, again, write out an infinite sequence, so you could write out x element x1, element and so on, up to xn, and then is an element of x0, is an element of x1, and you can go on like that forever. And that would again give you one of these forbidden infinite sequences. And hopefully these two conditions seem like uh, reasonable things you would want to forbid if you start thinking about what sort of sets would satisfy these conditions. Finally, we move on to the last axiom, namely the axiom of choice. So it says that every family of non-empty sets has a choice function. So here I need to explain what such a choice function is, and I think the easiest way to do this is just to draw a picture. So we suppose that we have some family of non-empty sets. So I'll uh, draw it like so. So we have like some sets here, let's call them like x1 x2, uh, x3. And now the idea is that for each one of these uh, sets occurring in the family, we want to pick an element out of each one of them simultaneously. Okay, so somehow a choice function will select from each of the sets in this family some, some element. Now the way to express this mathematically is as follows. So you have this, this collection here of these uh, x1, uh, x2, uh, x3, and so on. And now what we're going to do is we're going to define a function from this collection to the union over this collection. So the union will again be a set, but it now somehow contains all of the elements that originally were in x1, x2, and x3, and so on. So up here we can think about this part of the union being x1, this part of the union being x2, and this part of the union being x3. So this thing here I'll be calling S, and then this over here would be the union over S. And now the idea behind picking these elements, as I've drawn in this picture, will be to define a function going from S to the union of S, but in such a way that each of the sets in the collection is mapped to some element occurring in the corresponding uh, part of the union. So here I map um, x1, so the set x1 to some element in x1, and I map the set x2 to some element in x2, and I map the set x3 to some element in x3. And this thing here, so this f, this is a so-called choice function, and it satisfies this condition down here. So f is an, a function going from s to the union of s, and it satisfies that the image of each set x occurring in this collection lies in the set x itself. For instance, if I look at uh, x1, so the function f maps this set x1 to a point, and that point itself is an element of x1. And similarly, uh, x2 is mapped to a point in x2, and so on. 
So here what's maybe a bit confusing about this choice function is that somehow on the left hand side here we have this family of sets. So in this family basically uh, these sets here are like the, the points, right? So each of these uh, sets occurring in the collection is like a point and you map that point to another point but the point you're mapping to is now a part of the union. So here this point x1 is mapped to some element of x1 and this point x2 is mapped to some element of x2 and so on. And this realizes this idea I presented over here where you want to for each set select some element occurring in that set. Okay, with that uh, we can now again read uh, the axiom of choice. So it says for any family of non-empty sets, so whenever we have this situation here where uh, all of the sets are non-empty, well then there exists some choice function which allows us to for each set in this uh, collection to pick out one of the elements occurring in that set. Now the axiom of choice is quite strong and it has certain consequences which seem counterintuitive. On the other hand, it also has consequences which you really want to have. So it's kind of a, a weird thing where the axiom of choice is equivalent to certain statements which are very counterintuitive, but it's also equivalent to certain statements which you think should be intuitive. For instance, here I've uh, listed three statements which are equivalent to the axiom of choice. So the first statement here says that every Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty. In other words, the axiom of choice implies that every Cartesian product of non-empty sets is non-empty. And also, if you don't have the axiom of choice, then there in fact are Cartesian products of non-empty sets that are themselves empty. And here it seems like, well, this is a type of property you would want. So it's weird if you somehow can take Cartesian products of uh, non-empty sets and somehow have the resulting set be an empty set. Another statement which is equivalent to the axiom of choice is Zorn's lemma. This is something that's used uh, in many parts of mathematics in order to get certain maximal or minimal elements. I'm not going to go over what Zorn's lemma is uh, here, but you might have heard of it and well it's something that's very useful and is in fact required for certain uh, types of uh, arguments, for instance, in algebra. So from that perspective, also, uh, you would want the axiom of choice because you want to be able to use Zorn's lemma uh, in math. On the other hand, the axiom of choice also has certain counterintuitive equivalents. For instance, it's equivalent to the statement that every set can be well-ordered. Now, a well-ordered set is a set that has a order relation on it such that every non-empty subset uh, has a minimal element. The standard example for a well ordering are the natural numbers. So you have like uh, 1, uh, 0, 1, uh, 2, 3, and so on, and you have 0 being less than or equal to 1, uh, and it continues like that. Now if you take any non-empty uh, subset of the natural numbers, uh, that will have a minimal element. So the entire natural numbers have a minimal element 0, but then if you take any subset, you can find a minimal element in it. This is in fact uh, sort of one of the defining properties of the natural numbers. So uh, it's like the basis for that you can uh, do induction on the natural numbers. So in this context, having a well-ordered uh, set seems perfectly intuitive. However, this statement is much stronger. It's saying that every set can be well-ordered, which means that given any set whatsoever, you can find such a linear order on the set that is a well-ordering. In particular, uh, this means that, for instance, the real numbers can be well-ordered, and that's sort of a counterintuitive thing if you think about it. So a well-ordering on the real numbers would be a linear order on the real numbers, but that has the property that if you take any subset of real numbers whatsoever, that will have a minimal element. Now if you think about how this order needs to look in order to be a well-order, you'll find that it's uh, quite hard to think about and it seems like uh, it should be impossible to construct such an order. However, you can prove from the axiom of choice in a non-constructive manner that such a well-ordering uh, must exist for any set, and therefore, in particular, there must be such a well-ordering for the reals, but the proof doesn't tell you what this ordering looks like. 
So you're left in the situation where you think that such an ordering probably shouldn't exist, but you can prove that it does, but you still have no idea what the ordering actually should look like. So this is perhaps a counterintuitive property that is equivalent to the axiom of choice. And well, if you look at that sort of property, you might think that you might want to avoid using the axiom of choice um, because it has these uh, sort of counterintuitive consequences. In fact, there are weaker versions of the axiom of choice that you could still use to build up math. However, in those cases, well, this intuitive property here would then fail. So you would have, for instance, Cartesian products of non-empty sets that are in fact empty because this statement here is equivalent to the full version of the axiom of choice. All right, with that, we've covered all of the ZFC axioms. So that's quite an accomplishment. And we've also, in the process, built up the basic definitions of set theory. In particular, we've defined relations and functions. And so in principle, from here, you could now uh, start like doing usual mathematics in this axiomatic system. So for the most part, once you have shown that like Cartesian products uh, exist and that uh, functions exist and so on as sets, you can forget about most of these uh, axioms for set theory and you can just start doing usual math. In fact, most mathematicians don't really worry about the axiomatic foundations for set theory. So it's mostly just uh, set theorists who uh, worry about these sort of things. It's actually kind of rare to even encounter uh, the ZFC axioms in math courses that aren't about set theory or foundations explicitly. This means that many people actually uh, don't even know all of these, these axioms. So I think it's nice that actually in a fairly uh, short amount of time, one can go through all of these um, axioms and build up uh, the foundations of math that the rest of mathematics is supposedly uh, built upon.